The following program features archival footage from World War II. All of the images are real. Some are extremely graphic. Viewer discretion is advised. Berlin, Germany. Today it's the political and economic heart of Europe. But in April 1945, it becomes the stage for the Nazis' final fight for absolute power. The Ring of Steel is being imposed now around Fortress Europe, uh, and Hitler had to find a way of defending what he'd managed to conquer. In this film, we follow the Western Allies as they bear down on Nazi Germany and discover the terrible atrocities undertaken in the name of Nazism. A creed of pure evil and a program of mass murder carried out on an industrial scale. All culminating in the downfall of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. Featuring newsreel from the time, rare and enhanced archive footage, and the testimonies of those who were there. Some of the soldiers would herd them into the pit and make them lie down. That's how they were shot. This is World War II, witness to war. Normandy, France, June 1944. The Western Allies are about to undertake the largest amphibious assault in history. As British, American and Canadian forces deploy across the English Channel, thousands of miles away in the Pacific, US forces fight their way across Japan's island empire. And in the Soviet Union, the Red Army faces a grim attritional war against the full might of Germany's Wehrmacht. Troops in every theater of war are engaged in a bloody fight to the death. Moscow, June 1944. While the Western Allies are planning their assault in Normandy, Joseph Stalin and his generals prepare to drive the Nazis out of the Soviet Union once and for all. One of the biggest operations of the Second World War, mounted by the Allies, uh, was Operation Bagration. The Red Army targets Army Group Center, the central pillar of the German front in the east. Hoping to take the Wehrmacht by surprise, Soviet forces advance into Belarusia. Belarusia was not a very favorable territory for offense because there are a lot of marshes, forests, lakes, big rivers. That's why the Germans didn't expect Russians to, uh, to attack there. Millions of men, aircraft, tanks and so on, suddenly emerged in June 1944. An army group center was annihilated. In fact, this was a point at which the Red Army did to the Germans what the Germans had done to the Red Army in the first weeks of Operation Barbarossa three years before. The enemy was to be surrounded and bypassed. We were ordered to keep moving forwards. This was an unbelievably difficult war. We marched day and night without rest. We were fed on the go. We were given a piece of bread and a sausage, which we ate without stopping. We slept as we walked. For the Red Army, there was just simply one goal, to defeat the Germans, drive them out, defeat fascism. Um, kill a German, kill a German, every day, was one of the slogans that went into Red Army propaganda. It, it was a simple war aim. You just had to drive the Germans out. When I saw that after that fire, the German was down, I was very happy. After that, I had to kill them quite often. I did it calmly, without unnecessary emotion and sentiments. It was a war to the death, and there was no room in that war for either doubt or pity before pulling the trigger. Determined Red Army troops quickly overwhelmed the Germans. The Soviet armies, they 
pierced through the fortification, through the German defense lines in the south and in the north. And in, uh, in two weeks, they uh, encircled three big army groups in Ukraine. This was a collapse of the, of the whole group army center. One million soldiers. It's a very significant force. The German army is pushed back. Hitler's instinct was always to say, no retreat, stand firm. But there was just no way of standing firm. They stood firm, the German army would have been uh, annihilated. And as the Wehrmacht retreats, the Red Army grows in confidence. There was this, this, this growing sense, as the German army was turned back, that, that they would be able to defeat the Germans, that they really would do what the regime wanted them to do, save Mother Russia and defeat the fascist invader. It seems that Adolf Hitler's adventure in Russia is finally over. But Stalin doesn't intend to stop there. He sets his sights firmly on the heart of the Reich. Berlin, 1944. While German forces are pulling back, an Allied aerial bombardment is giving the capital a terrible pounding. Despite food shortages and an infrastructure that's crumbling around them, many Berliners remain committed to the Nazi cause. Dr. Goebbels and his and his propaganda machine managed to continuously lie to the German people and tell the Germans that they must win because they were the master race. And the German people, many of them, continue to believe that the Fuhrer will lead them to ultimate victory. Their faculties for critical thinking have been so impaired by a generation of lies that even when the truth is staring them in the face, many of them fail to see it. But in reality, the Allies are closing in from all sides. The Russian counteroffensive is unstoppable, and the German army is in full retreat. Soviet forces drove forward into Poland. They began to approach Warsaw. Uh, this was an extraordinary achievement in itself. Poland, July 1944. Now, having forced German troops out of Russia, the Soviet Red Army marches towards Warsaw. Now the Russians fight for liberation from the gross barbarities of German rule. As they approach the city of Lublin, the Russian troops make a horrific discovery. Arriving in Lublin, we paused in our advance and went into the death camp at Majdanek. The things we saw there, the ovens, still had the ashes of human beings everywhere. In the courtyard were three heaps of ashes standing a meter and a half tall. Clothing and shoes have been cleaned and ironed, children's shoes in one area, women's shoes in another, all neatly laid out. And everywhere, women's braids and dresses. A horror. How could such things have been done? When the Red Army found Majdanek, they didn't yet know that this was uh, part of a huge camp system. They didn't know that it was simply an aberration. The reaction of Soviet troops was, as one might expect, I mean, they were horrified at what they saw. Made Red Army soldiers think, next time I catch a German, you know, they're for it. Majdanek is the first shocking glimpse of the Nazis' Jewish genocide. It's a system of industrialized murder rooted in racist Nazi ideology that began well before the start of World War II. Poland, 1944. The Soviet Red Army uncovers the Nazi death camp at Majdanek. The shocked troops have no idea that the camp is only part of something far more appalling. A Nazi program of genocide born of twisted racial theories, the seeds of which were planted many years earlier. Germany, 1933. Adolf Hitler and his National Socialist Party come to power. His ambitions for Germany inspire a nation. But the Nazis are consumed with a hatred for the Jews. 
What's so striking about the case of uh, the Third Reich is that, uh, unlike elsewhere, you have uh, a, a government that comes to power which is obsessed with anti-Semitism. It's not that uh, Germany as a whole, the whole population, is somehow more anti-Semitic than any other country uh, in the rest of Europe, but rather that the people who lead the Nazi party from the start, from the 1920s onwards, are obsessed uh, with the Jews. Hitler sets out to deal with Germany's Jews with a policy of ruthless persecution. Anti-Semitic policy in Germany under Hitler moved forward step by step. It didn't all happen at once. First of all, there were boycotts. There were attempts to stop Germans from going to Jewish shops or visiting Jewish lawyers or doctors. Then Jewish children had to go and be taught in Jewish schools. And then came the race laws in 1935 in which Jews lost their uh, uh, citizenship status and so on. Then the Aryanization drive, taking over Jewish properties, eliminating Jewish wealth, and it's step by step. Most of the Germans were willing to exclude the Jews from German society. So they said, well, the people's community, the Volksgemeinschaft, uh, we and the Jews don't belong to that. Nobody could predict the Holocaust. And so when the first signs of anti-Semitism. They didn't immediately think that this was the beginning of a genocide. Um, it was almost seen as kind of a continuation of long traditions of anti-Semitism. This is where propaganda is so dangerous because it kind of excites the imagination and it really draws out people's inner passions that they may not be completely aware of or want to fully embrace in the early 1930s. But by the late 1930s, extremely racist discourse has become so publicly accepted. Paris, November the 9th, 1938. A German diplomat is assassinated by a young Jewish man. Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels seizes the opportunity to stir up anti-Semitic feeling in Germany. Violence against Jews sweeps the country. What I saw was hordes of people standing in front of our beautiful synagogue and throwing stones through these magnificent colored windows. The noise, the shouting, the screaming. I suppose there was a, an, an aura of, of eeriness about it. I mean, it was a, a total chaos, a total destruction. All our show windows had been smashed. My father was arrested. His father was arrested, and it was just a terrible situation. These outrages aren't only committed by Nazi party members. It's quite clear that large numbers of people took part uh, willingly and not just uh, those who belong to the SA or the SS. On the other hand, there were many who felt an enormous disquiet about this. Uh, so there was a range of views, but what the leadership understood most of all was that nobody would come to the aid of the Jews, that the people might dislike it, they didn't want to see the violence and the bloodshed, but there would be no protest about it. More than 7,000 Jewish-owned businesses are looted and damaged. Hundreds of synagogues are burned to the ground. And all across Germany, Jewish cemeteries are desecrated. The SS, the Nazi paramilitary wing, takes advantage of the mayhem to consolidate its power. They are increasingly wanting to take control of Jewish policies. On the night of the 9th, 10th of November, the SS takes over. This night comes to be known as Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass. And for the Jews of Europe, there's much worse to come. September 1939. As the dark clouds of war gather over Europe, the full fury of the German Blitzkrieg is unleashed upon Poland. Now the sick Nazi vision of racial purity is about to engulf the largest Jewish population in Europe. But it's not really until the war has started uh, that the future fate of the Jews is, is beginning to take shape. Within a few weeks, of course, the German armies came in and things completely changed straight away. First of all, as soon as they came in, they destroyed most of the synagogues. And, you know, 
to, to, a, to a child, even nine year old, to destroy a synagogue is, is the most terrible thing that could happen. I called a, a, a Jewish man, you know, with a long beard, which they knew he was Jew. You could recognize the Jewish people that were Orthodox. They used to first think they did, you know, to cut the beard off. And I, and I asked, why are they do it? You know, I didn't ask the Germans. I asked my grandmother, why do they do that? They said, purely to humiliate him. Polish Jews throughout the country are rounded up and forced into ghettos. In 1939, 1940, when they were first created, it's obvious from Heydrich's instructions that they were to be set up as holding pens for the Jews further to the realization of the ultimate goal. The four of us moved into one single room on the second floor. No running water, no toilet, no everything. They surrounded with barbed wire. If he was caught outside the ghetto, he was shot. People were dying of malnutrition and, and of course, frost. And it was that cold. As Poland's Jewish population begins to feel the cruel realities of Nazi ideology, Hitler turns his gaze to the east. The Soviet Union, June 1941. Hitler reneges on the non-aggression pact agreed with Joseph Stalin and launches Operation Barbarossa, a full-scale invasion of communist Russia. Now that the long-expected clash is on, the might of Russia, that unknown quantity, will be revealed. Communism was understood as uh, the major threat to Germany because in Nazi ideology, communism and Jews went hand in hand. Nazis understood that the Soviet Union as a system, of course, had to be beaten militarily, but that system in itself was governed by uh, a, a way of thinking which derived from Judeo-Bolshevism. Uh, and so the racial war, the war of annihilation, and the military war were effectively the same thing. As the Wehrmacht steamrolls its way into Soviet territory, special SS units called Einsatzgruppen follow on behind. As the Germans expanded into Eastern Europe, uh, they began to see the systematic and mass extermination of Jews as the best possible option. The Einsatzgruppen are now given very clear orders that they are, first of all, in June 41, to kill uh, Jewish partisans, uh, commissars, and so on. Within six weeks, that has developed into killing all Jews, irrespective of, of age, gender, and so on. Um, that is something quite different from what has gone before. It was very, very scary. The Jews were treated immediately in a very arrogant way. My father and my two uncles, they took them to the woods and shot them. But when I went to the wood, I went close to the place where they were shot. And I remember some cries, so probably many people were wounded. And I was scared and I ran back. Both the army and the Einsatzgruppen were killing men, women, and children. Anti-Semitism was widespread in the German army. And most of the young soldiers have been exposed to anti-Semitic propaganda now for 10 years. So for them, seeing the Jew as the enemy, the hidden enemy, the enemy you had to eliminate, was not such an odd thing. Uh, for them, the Jew somehow was defined in this rather metaphorical way as the enemy of the German. What's also horrific is to think of how many locals also partook in these, in these executions in, in Eastern Europe. Sometimes locals didn't even need uh, to be encouraged by the, the Nazis who were who were making their way eastwards, they did it themselves. So this is one of the many complexities about how the Holocaust was carried out. They took us to a large building and uh, they told us to get undressed and uh, they would make you take off the jewelry and everything, any valuables that you had on you. And all the women, were so embarrassed that they were 
without anything on top that they all cover their, their breasts with their hands. We started walking the street and there were some Ukrainians who were cheering as we were walking by and they were applauding and cheering that this is what was done to us. Collaboration exists on the level of individuals. We see this very clearly in Eastern Europe, for example, uh, after Jews have been shot in small towns, the, their neighbors rush in and steal their pots and pans and bits and pieces. And so this theft on a, a micro scale is one consequence of uh, the killing of the Jews. In terms of institutions, we see, for example, auxiliary police forces, um, concentration camp guards and others being formed in Ukraine, in the Baltic states. Lithuanians were mostly assigned to round people up. Nobody tells you how many will be brought, a thousand or two, a hundred or however many. You just come, shoot for a while and then they replace you. Some of the soldiers would herd them into the pit and make them lie down. One row went, then another climbs in and lies down on them. That's how they were shot. Unimaginable. A person who hasn't seen it can't imagine it. Einsatzgruppen, these special squads, uh, shoot about one and a half million uh, Jews. In every small town and uh, village across occupied uh, Belar what's today Belarus, Ukraine, uh, the Western, Western Russia, the Baltic states, Jews are massacred in, in pits uh, in enormous numbers, uh, sometimes in, in the tens of thousands. But the bloody murders begin to take a toll on those carrying them out. Himmler, who was in charge of the enterprise of mass murder, saw that this was having a corrosive effect on, on his people. He saw that SS people were becoming psychological casualties as a result of having to murder so many. SS men were becoming psychological casualties because they were shooting innocent, defenseless people. Himmler decides that a different, more efficient method is required. A search for a final solution to the Jewish question becomes the new Nazi obsession. The real decision of we are going to kill all Jews in Europe did not come before the second half of 1941. There was a German decision, a decision by Hitler, we are going to kill the Jews. Berlin, January 1942. Hitler's Operation Barbarossa is so far a resounding success. Behind the front line, Jewish Russians are being systematically murdered by Nazi death squads. But to Hitler, it's an unsatisfactory process. Once the Germans stopped their rapid advances, in 1941-1942 and were faced with the problem of large Jewish populations in territory that Nazi ideology required to be made free of Jews. They had to adapt their methods that would enable them to kill as many people as rapidly as possible to enable the Aryan colonization of Europe. That is, the German post-war order that the Germans envisioned was a Nazi superstate with no Jews. You've got millions of Jews. What do you do with them? You can't make them emigrate because there's nowhere to send them to in their millions. You can't just make them disappear. You've got to kill them. In January 1942, Reinhard Heydrich, Heinrich Himmler's most trusted commander, organizes the Van Sea Conference where some of the Third Reich's key decision makers come together to answer the Jewish question once and for all. Berlin, 
January 1942. Nazi High Command gathers for a special conference in the suburb of Van C. The gathering of people at Van C was a bringing together of uh, various SS institutions and, crucially, state institutions, bringing them together so that Heydrich could basically say to them, we're in charge of this. Who objects? And whilst one or two of them are less willing than others, they're all frightened, uh, and they basically all sign up to it. When the senior organs of the Nazi state came together at the Wannsee Conference to agree the final solution, the, the destruction of Europe's Jewry, they did so in a way that involved marshalling the resources of a modern industrial state to achieve a modern industrial policy using modern industrial means. Under proper guidance in the course of the final solution, the Jews are to be allocated for appropriate labor in the East. Able-bodied Jews, separated according to sex, will be taken in large work columns to these areas for work on roads, in the course of which action doubtless a large portion will be eliminated by natural causes. The possible final remnant will have to be treated accordingly. As part of a plan named Operation Reinhard, construction of a series of death camps is already underway. It's interesting where these death camps were located. It's not in the center of the Reich, it's not in Berlin. The real death camps were in Poland, so outside the Reich. Um, where they could be controlled quite easily, and they were out of the reach uh, of the German people. So that's, I mean, they could control that, also the access of information. So that's the really, the bloodlands were uh, in Poland. Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka. These were camps that were established in order to kill the Jews of occupied Poland. Those death camps were the first places created specifically for killing people. Uh, and that's all they were. They were not concentration camps in any shape or form. The Nazis now focus on driving Jewish populations from all over Europe into their factories of death. Summer of 1942 is when you can really see the final solution in operation. So the large actions in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, in, in other ghettos in occupied Poland, and the deportations of the, of the Jews of, uh, of Western Europe. Ordinary Germans just watch their Jewish neighbors being rounded up, taken off in lorries and so on. They watch you know, the, the huddle groups of Jews with their small amount of luggage that they're allowed to take and so on. They watch them going off. They don't ask themselves very hard questions, I think, about where the Jews are going. We also know from, uh, not so much in, in the occupied countries, but from the deportations of the Jews in Germany itself, these deportations took place in broad daylight uh, we see, we have photographs of uh, Jews marching through small towns with onlookers uh, standing around, laughing, uh, enjoying the spectacle. Most of the decisions about the deportations took, or took place from Berlin. However, local support was necessary in order to help with these roundups and these arrests and these deportations. Um, the Germans couldn't do it all by themselves. Jews living in Western Europe begin their journeys east, little knowing what awaits them. One of the biggest uh, differences between the Jewish experience in Western Europe and Eastern Europe in this 1940 to 42 period is precisely that, you know, in 1941, the Jews were having to deal with the Einsatzgruppen, whereas, you know, in France, you know, it's not that it wasn't serious, but it was restricted to really to legislation. So in Western Europe, a lot of Jews still believed in the system. It's fairly clear, I think, that uh, the majority of the, the Jews who were deported had, of course, a sense of foreboding, of, of fear, uh, but the idea that they were going to go to be sent to camps where they would simply be killed was, even for those who might have heard rumors, was too much to believe. Throughout Europe, trains transport millions to the Nazi death camps. Conditions inside the trains are truly terrible. We were in the train, over 100 people. The only facility in the train was two buckets. 
for over a hundred men, women, and children. Lack of air. It was unbearable hot. Me being among the youngsters, I was asked to climb up those packages and look out to see where we're going. I saw some Polish peasants lining the road. Some made signs to us, pointing to the sky. Some went with their fingers across the straw. I didn't tell the people what I saw. Those who were deported in, in cattle trucks, uh, particularly from the furthest flung places, like in Greece, it could take a week to reach Auschwitz. The trains would sit on sidings because military traffic had priority. Um, and after a week, with, with no food and water, most of the people in the cars were already dead on arrival. The process of deportation was itself genocidal. The vulgar and brutal uh, sensory experience of the Holocaust was something that uh, people had to suddenly grapple with for the first time uh, before they'd even reached the camps. Those who survived the journey now face unimaginable horrors. It was late at night that we arrived at Auschwitz. When we came in, the minute the gates opened up, we heard screams, barking of dogs, blows from, from those kapos, those officials walking from them over the head, and then we got out of the train. And everything went so fast left, right, right, left, men separated from women, children torn from the arms of mothers, the elderly chased like cattle, the sick, the disabled were handled like packs of garbage. They were thrown in a side together with broken suitcases, with, with boxes. My mother ran over to me and grabbed me by the shoulders. And she told me, Libele, I'm not going to see you no more. Take care of your brother. Auschwitz was different from the pure death camps in that on arrival, people would be assessed in terms of whether or not they were fit to work. Uh, those who were were the ones who were registered into the camp, so who were, uh, were stripped, uh, shaved, uh, showered, deloused, uh, given the striped uniform, tattooed and, and registered uh, into the camp. Those who were not were sent immediately to the gas chambers and killed. They said, from now on, you do not answer by your name. Your name is your number. And the delusion, the disappointment, the discouragement that I felt, I felt like I was not a human person anymore. They had shaved our heads, and I felt so ashamed. And also when they told us to undress and to shower, they made us feel like, like we were animals. The killing of the Jews through gas chambers has been considered a kind of rupture with civilization, with killing practices as they've gone on before. Up until the creation of the gas chambers, you could say that the, the Nazis' killing program in Eastern Europe was a bit like a colonial genocide, in the sense that here you see an occupying force taking the land from its inhabitants and, and killing them in the process. As Nazi atrocities continue and war rages on, the terrors of Auschwitz stay hidden from the rest of the world. Poland, January 1945. Russia's Red Army has the Wehrmacht on the run. Aircraft leading the counteroffensive continue to give the Hun a belly full of his own mitts. As the Soviets continue to press west, they stumble across an enormous Nazi camp. The horrors of Auschwitz are finally uncovered. What we saw cannot be related in words. It can only be demonstrated through a film recording. It was horrible. 
Horrible. Corpses crawling, live corpses. I endured so much, but what I saw in Auschwitz shocked me. In human suffering, any trace of humanity died. Only pain and sorrow remained. Without tears, we could not look at what was in front of us. What the Soviets discovered was the bones of a massive industrial operation to kill people. And even in the brutal Soviet Union, nobody had seen anything like this in the world before. As Russian soldiers attempt to come to terms with the Nazi genocide, Allied commanders are closing in on Hitler's Reich. Berlin, April 1945. While the Western Allies push through Germany, Russia's Red Army bears down on the German capital from the east. As the Soviets come closer to the center of Berlin, the Germans are collapsing, and the Soviets are becoming stronger and more focused. By the time the Red Army had got to uh, the campaign against Berlin, the Red Army was huge. Um, there were millions of men, but more important, I think, is, you know, there were you know, 12, 15,000 aircraft, 12, 15,000 tanks. The Soviets know that taking Berlin will mean a battle of epic proportions. Berlin. April 1945. Germany's capital is surrounded by the Soviet Red Army. Adolf Hitler and his generals try to command what remains of the Wehrmacht from a bunker beneath the German Chancellery. Above ground, the soldiers and citizens of Berlin are under frenzied attack. My mother could not stand the hearing the falling of the bombs anymore. So we went down into this shelter and uh, you couldn't hear a thing. And at one point, when I came out, I thought, I can't understand this. Every time we come out of this uh, bunker, there's thunder, until I realized it wasn't a thunderstorm at all. It was the gunfire from the Eastern Front. And night after night, it came nearer and nearer and nearer. In the last weeks of the war in Berlin, conditions were appalling. Uh, desperate shortage of food. There have been heavy bombing uh, right across the winter of 44, 45. Uh, the Red Army was approaching. There were terrible stories of Red Army atrocities and so on. For people living in Berlin, the prospects were bleak. Despite staring defeat in the face, German High Command refuses to surrender. The German High Command continued to fight the war in April 1945 against all the odds. I mean, clearly, you know, defeat was only a, a, a short distance away. But as long as Hitler was alive and he was their supreme commander and he was telling them to go on fighting, they went on fighting. But for German people, you know, they just wanted the war to end. They wanted the bombing to stop. Everybody was terribly weary, but you couldn't do anything about it. You, w you wanted to, to escape it, but you couldn't. The German army was scraping the bottom of the barrel when it came to, to recruitment. Small children are being dragged into the German armed forces to use rocket launchers against tanks. And elderly people are being dragged into the battle for Berlin because that's all that's left. The, the old home guard, the Volkssturm, the men, oh, some over 70, they gave them, uh, I think they were Belgian rifles with, uh, with no ammunition. And they expected them to go out and fight. Berlin was encircled. Red Army drove north and south of Berlin to complete the encirclement. And then they had to begin street by street fighting. There's bitter hand-to-hand -hand urban warfare among the rubble of Berlin. Apart from the artillery, which was pounding Berlin even then, we also heard of, of street fights, 
uh, actual streets being fought over that we knew by name that, that were near enough to make us realize that it was only a question of time. When the Red Army arrived in Berlin, they behaved more or less as Berlin as it expected. I already knew that my entire family was shot. My mother, sisters, all shot. It was revenge, revenge. In some cases, some guys picked up a dead German, tied him to a pole, stretched out his arm, pointed his hand to the east. These are the tricks we played. In his underground bunker, hidden away from the fighting, a deluded Hitler tries to maintain the illusion of command. He was leading a, a hollow existence. You know, he was moving armies around on the map that didn't exist. He was giving orders to people who you know, were about to surrender. He was living in a fantasy world now, um, a kind of you know, vast Wagnerian drama in which he would go down in a, in a pool of blood and fire. On April 30th, 1945, Adolf Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich finally comes to an end. He bites onto a cyanide capsule and then shoots himself in the head. On the very same day, after weeks of bloody street fighting, the Soviets reached the heart of Nazi Germany, Berlin's Reichstag building. We wanted to climb the Reichstag, reach the cupola. I was a desperate person. Climbing on the narrow burn beams, I reached the banner of victory. I grabbed the banner, held it for a few minutes. Cold sweat poured from my body. The entire war we dreamed about. To reach the enemy's lair. I reached it. With the Soviet flag now flying above the Reichstag, the message is clear. Germany is defeated. May the 8th, 1945. After five and a half years of a pitiless war that has consumed the world, Germany agrees to an unconditional surrender. And the stain of Nazism is at last removed. But while the street parties, dancing and scenes of joy fill the streets of London, Paris and New York, those who have somehow survived it all know that the world can never be the same again. And World War II is not over yet.